Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. You're listening to the Think Unbroken podcast, and I'm your host, Michael Unbroken. I'm an author, speaker, coach, and advocate for adult survivors of childhood trauma and abuse. In this podcast, you will learn how to transform your trauma into triumph, turn breakdowns into breakthroughs, and go from victim to being the hero of your own story. You can learn more at thinkunbrokenpodcast.com, and of course, check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify at Think Unbroken Podcast. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with another episode with my guest and friend, Sarah Dean, who is the host of the Shameless Mom Academy podcast. What's up, my friend? How are you today? Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm pumped to have you. This is this is like a real treat to be in this fancy environment. It's not that fancy. It's, <laughs> it's literally this a bedroom. Like the, this is, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but this is but this is like super legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, for me, I was like, I want people to be able to come and sit down and have a real conversation in a space that feels comfortable. Thank you, you for know? that. I mean, that that speaks to the kind of the, the preciousness that you hold for the conversations that you that you carry. Yeah. Well, it's important, right? Yeah. And I, I think one part of this show is getting into the crux of who a human is. And the other mm-hmm. part of it is like, I want to be comfortable because I do this all day. So yes. let's call let's call it what it <laughs> is. It win-win for everyone. <laughs> it has to be. You win, know? win, win. Us and the audience. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> That's the same I think about it every single day. Um, to start with, what's one thing about your past, about who you are that I need to know to understand who you are today? So one thing that came up in my life just a couple of years ago, but is connected to tiny little Sarah from many, many years ago, is I was diagnosed with PTSD. And when I got that diagnosis, I was completely shocked because I didn't know that I had, I did, there was nothing in my life where I would have said, oh yeah, that trauma I experienced. So it's been a really interesting journey over the last few years to recognize how that shows up in my life in a lot of different ways that I couldn't really previously connect. Mm. What was that? Um, so like the the triggering incident. Yeah, yeah. So my parents got divorced when I was four, which is, and it was like totally amicable, easy, clean. And I should say easy, clean in air quotes, like as clean as a divorce can be. And so I always felt grateful that my parents did this in a way that we, my sister and I didn't have to go through a custody battle. It was never really a big deal, but we didn't 
ever process that really quick, immediate loss. And so when I got the diagnosis around PTSD, I thought, oh, it's because my parents got divorced, which feels really weird because like, what is that 50% of kids walking around or people walking around then have that same trauma. So I was like, that doesn't feel like the right thing, but I mean, I don't know, maybe. And so in walking through this over the course of a few years and kind of what comes out on the back end of that for me is anxiety, like a heightened sense of anxiety that I can track throughout my entire life. Um, in talking that through in therapy and then doing some hypno work with a friend, dear friend of mine, we were able to figure out that the trauma for me wasn't the divorce. The trauma for me was after the fact, around the time I was eight years old, I started having a form of panic attacks during the night where I would wake up every single night convinced that our house was being robbed. And I mm. would, I could hear someone, I could hear someone in the house. I could hear, I always thought someone was trying to steal the kitchen table and I would like hear the table like bumping against the floor as they were pulling it out. All of these images in my head and very true sensory experiences. And I would call for my mom and my mom would come in and I would say, I just want to go sleep in your room. And she would always say, no, we're not going to start that because if I let you do it once, you're going to want to do it every night, which she was right. I would have wanted to do it every Mm -hmm. night. But what that resulted in was me spending every night in my bedroom, scared and alone for a large part of my childhood. And so in talking this through in hypnotherapy, the trauma for me was feeling really, really unsafe and not having someone be able to hold me in those moments and instead saying, I'm going to leave you here for you to figure that out. And it seems like a weird thing to be like, I have PTSD because I got scared during the night. But because it happened over such a long period of time, my coping mechanism became, I have to figure things out on my own. Other people are not going to show up for me. Other people are not going to protect me. And the anxiety that came out on the back end has been a lot of defensiveness um, and like self-preservation and not being able to trust in a lot of relationships um, and having a lot of anxious attachment in relationships because having a lot of uncertainty around are, are people safe and are they going to see me and hold me when I really need them? Yeah. Well, it's a domino effect, right? Totally. And and this is something I had Dr. Gabor Mate on mm, back yeah, yeah. in November and he and I had a conversation mm. Um, which was exactly in the scope of this, where he said, if you go look at many Native American tribes at the turn of the century before a lot of colonization took place, there were um, the rearing of the the children. If kid cried, they were picked up. Mm-hmm. They were cuddled. They were given that thing. And there's this, and it's universal in a lot of the world, except for America, where for whatever reason here, we have adopted this mentality that if a kid, and a lot of Western states, I should add, that if your kid is crying, let them cry it out. Mm-hmm. And you're like, think about the rationale behind that and how like really actually insane it is. Right. Because as an adult, when you are at your lowest and you're hurting and you're crying, what right. do you want more than to be in connection with a person who's just there for right. you for a moment? Right. And when adults show that kind of vulnerability, like no, with our partners or our friends or whatever, we're not like, yeah, bye, you're going to need to figure that out on your own. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if you do, then you should get <laughs> new friends. Right, right, right. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if your wife is like, get away from me, you're crying, get a new right, wife. Right, right, right. You know, she, she, she should listen to this podcast. Yeah, um, definitely. How, how did that affect your relationship mm-hmm. with your parents and specifically your mother? So I, my relate, it's interesting my relationship with my mom has always been really great. And so it's been an interesting realization that the person who did take care of me and provide security in all other aspects of my life, it feels like I'm calling her out to say like, "Uh, you really didn't show up for me. I needed you in these moments because she was a single mom very much hustling her off to do her best. And she did a really fantastic job, Mm. but she just didn't know that this like what to do in this circumstance and situation. Um, So that relationship is still a really great relationship. I haven't really dug into this piece of it with her because I think that would traumatize her. Um, She's 84. She doesn't do a lot on social media and listen to podcasts and things like that. So I'm like, I don't know if she needs to know that, you know, the full scope of it. She knows a little bit of it. um, But I feel protective of her. I'm also looking at like, you know, that traumatization was probably a re-traumatization of a dad who walked out on his family two weeks before Christmas when his daughter was four years old without any notice. And then there was no processing around that. So there is this compounded effect of like, you know, people not holding space for me. It's not just on my mom. Um, And my relationship with my dad is very different. He never showed up for me and held space for me when I 
when I needed him in vulnerable moments. He showed up when he could be really proud of me and when I did great things. But um, so those two things, those two relationships look really, really different. Um, but yeah, I haven't. It's interesting how like my mom didn't protect me in that way, but I want to protect her from knowing that she didn't protect me in that way. Sure. Yeah. Well, and and you know, also there there are certain things I think about around those moments and experiences where I mean, generally speaking, I don't have children. I'm just gonna put my if I had a kid hat on. Like you don't know your f-ing your kid up. Totally. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I have a ten year old, and I'm like, oh my. I, if he comes in my room in the middle of the night and he's like, mom, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm like, come right here. I will hold you forever. <laughs> which, which might also be <laughs> him totally. up. And in right? 50 years, he'll be like, you destroyed there, me. By- <laughs> there, there's something fascinating to me that people, for whatever reason, seem to think that they are going to guide their children perfectly and they will come out unscathed. And I'm yeah. like, you're literally, uh, my thought is like, do your best not to destroy them entirely. So yeah. then I don't have to coach them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was having this conversation just last week with someone where we were talking about how it was actually interviewing someone for the Shameless Mom Academy. And we were talking about how we have this like heightened sense of evolution when we get to a certain point in our lives. And you're like, oh, gosh, I've learned so much over the last 10 years or whatever. And so now that I know better, I can do better and blah, blah, blah. And you look back at the things 10 years ago and you're like, oh, I'm so ashamed of that. Like, I can't believe I didn't know these things or was messing it up so badly. Well, like me, the mom who's doing what I'm doing for my kid now, I'm 47, he's 10. I feel really good about how I'm parenting him. And I'm like, gosh, in 10 years, I might feel totally different and be like, holy cow, I didn't know what I didn't know when I was 47 and he was 10 and now he's 20 and look what I've done. So it's, (laughs) we're always all just doing the best we can with what we've got in any given moment. But we're always thinking that we like got it all figured out. I, I don't think that often at all because I've just come to realize like I have, when I used to be very stubborn, Mm-hmm. So I, I know my, who I am, like yeah. know thyself is the most important thing in the yeah. journey. Yeah. I know I'm stubborn. Mm-hmm. Like I know it's like in my bones and I know that that is my greatest strength and my greatest weakness. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that I've had to do to reconcile that, that moves me forward as opposed to stopping me is just I'm like, I'm like, I don't know anything. Put me in the room. Please let me be the dumbest person in the room constantly. Yeah. And that only came through this choice of the willingness. Like, I'm going to go step into the unknown and find out who I am. And that moment that you shared seems like that might have been a part of your journey. Yeah. What prompted that for you? Because I think a lot of people who are listening, they're like, yeah, well, I'm in my 40s and I have a family and I like it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. Right. Which tends to be the thing. Eh, it's not that right. bad. So why am I going to do something? Why do I need to do in the inner work? Um, so I found myself a few years ago, I've had anxiety my whole life, but I didn't know that's what it was. I just thought that like, I'm kind of type A, (laughs) like I'm just a control freak. Um, and what happened over the course of time, I started to recognize how unhealthy and, um, unsustainable it was to wake up every single morning with like a huge ball of dread in my stomach. And Mm. I started talking about it. I started doing therapy. Um, I went to a psychiatrist and I started the therapist said like, what does this anxiety feel like for you? And I said, I wake up every morning and it's like, there's this pit in my stomach. And even on a day where there's things I'm really looking forward to, where I know like, she's going to be a great day. There's all these things to look forward to. There's this pit there. That's like, okay, but like, what if this goes wrong or that goes wrong? Or what if you don't, you know, achieve in this way? Or what if you can't figure that thing out? And so we spent a lot of time talking about like that knot and what does it take to unravel that knot? And what is what would it be like to not wake up with that in the morning to wake up and be like, oh, I got this. It's fine. Or just to wake up and not have any thoughts about like just to wake up and be like, I'm just going to go brush my teeth and like Mm -hmm. not be emotionally processing from the moment you wake up. Um, And so it was really, I think, knowing that. I was waking up with that. I was carrying it with me all day. There were a lot of moments in my day where I would have this internal uh, sense of overwhelm that felt sometimes um, like I couldn't, like my mind was moving at a pace that I couldn't control, but I was having to like live in reality that moved much slower. And it felt like this huge disconnect for like, I'm trying to keep up with my brain, but I can't. Um, and it just became absolutely exhausting. And there's times when it's still exhausting and I take medication and do therapy and like do all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really reaching out and being like, m- my brain is like, it's too much for me right now. And getting the diagnosis of general anxiety disorder and PTSD and it helped tremendously in kind of getting to put some pieces together and recognize and being able to name like, oh, that's what I'm feeling. And that's why I'm feeling it. Okay. Now I can like neutralize it and move on. 
Yeah, the the naming it part is the game changer for me. <clears throat> yeah, you know when I really try because in my in my teens and my twenties, I just assumed I was crazy, mm. right? My mother crazy, my grandmother crazy, my stepfather crazy, and I'm not using that word lightly. They mm-hmm. are. Fucking crazy, mm-hmm. bipolar, manic, suicidal, um, narcissistic to a T, like textbook, right? And and I know those are buzz- buzzwords people throw around, but right. when I was a kid, we just called you crazy. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm living this lifestyle where it's like doing gnarly, where I'm doing mm-hmm. stuff where I'm like, this is so insane. Like I don't even know because this mm-hmm. thing in my brain is like, this is normal, right? Right. The same experience that you're. Yeah, having. and it is really interesting how you're. Could you identify that like it felt normal to you, but like it wasn't a com like everyone I'm, else's? I'm experience? the one having the interview right now. Ma'am. Um, <laughs> I know. Let me take over the interview. <laughs> yeah. No, but 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 here's my thought on it. Like I I distinctly remember having this moment, these moments of being out of control and recognizing I was out of control, but right. the chaos felt so good. Okay. This is the thing people don't understand. See, the understand. chaos doesn't feel good to me. Which is actually where I was going to lead into. <laughs> with, with anxiety, I think the people, most people, they get stuck in the rumination of the disaster, yes. right? I.e. Yes. someone's breaking the house, stealing the kitchen right. table, the, the place is burning down. Right. So most people, they go into hyperactivity to mm-hmm. turn that off. Yeah. Is that what you did? Yes, but all internally. And And also, so like my rumination, I know is not normal compared to the people that I spend time with. And so it's like this rumination that is just quietly happening where I'm like, if anyone sitting around me right now knew all the things that I was thinking at one time. And so it's that high level or like um, hyper awareness that I know that I'm like taking things in or seeing things, feeling things on a different scale than other people. Um, And like you were like, I'm going to act on these things and be, it sounds like be big and bold. I was like, I'm just going to internalize this and feel like I'm, there's a lot happening inside, but not process it with anyone or not tell anyone that I'm feeling like it's too much. Um, and that's the exhausting part was like having to carry it, but then look quote unquote, very normal on the outside, look like a, you know, just high achiever, successful person, driven person, ambitious person, um, without acknowledging that like there's kind of constant panic in the background. What did not acknowledging it do for you? Because there's some, let let me ask the question this way, because there's something about high achievers when we just put it to the side, we go, it's like that meme, everything's on fire and it's like the little cat and he's like, it's fine, Mm -hmm. right? Is that what it was for you? I mean. Um, A little bit. I think the not acknowledging it piece over time just was, became mentally extremely grueling. Mm. Um, and to the point where like, it felt like, uh, like if you're going through, um, so let's say you're going through a divorce and so you tell your friends like, how oh, as it turns out, we're separating and people are kind of along the ride with you and they kind of have a sense of what's going on. It felt like I had gotten so far down this road of like internal panic and anxiety that it, there never felt like it was the right time to like let someone in because the train was like kind of already so off the rails to be like, hey, so by the way, I just wanted to let you know for like, you know, 30 some years, I've had really bad anxiety and it's become really crippling. Like it just never felt like there was a window to bring people in. So it felt increasingly isolating, I think. And it also felt started to feel really incongruent with like who I was and the work that I was doing where like the stuff I talk about on the podcast around like, just nurture yourself and show up for yourself. And like kind of all, all these things started to feel like platitudes if well, I'm doing those things and, you know, encouraging people to live big, bold, brave lives. I'm doing it in a constant state of panic in the background. Mm. But that's your norm. It's totally my Th- norm. This is the thing that people don't <clears throat> always process. It's yeah. like, that is what you know. Yeah. And yeah. the and the unknown of that is arguably more scary than the known. Yeah. Can I tell you what my therapist told me to do that made me so mad? Yeah, of course. There's two things. So the first thing she told me on our first session, she's like, I, when you're feeling panicky or when you're feeling a lot of anxiety, she's like, I just want you to do some mindfulness activities. And before she even finished saying mindfulness activities, I was like rolling my eyes like, oh, my God, I'm not doing mindfulness activities. And then she told me the first activity. <laughs> and again, because I'm like, I work in this space. I don't need mindfulness activities. Yeah. 
the first I, I'm not here for you to tell me what to do. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I actually could give you some tips. How about that? <laughs> so she was like, next time you're feeling anxiety, I just want you to look around and notice what you see, notice what you smell, go through all your senses, notice all the things around you and identify like, I am safe. I can see this. I can mm. touch this. I can smell this, all this. And I was like, yeah, that's ridiculous. So I was like mad about that because I was like, that's not an actual tool. And then the next session, she told me that in the morning, she's like, I think that it would really help you if you spent like 30 minutes first thing in the morning just sitting down with your tea or coffee and just sitting in silence and thinking. And I was like, oh my God, do not tell an anxious person to just sit there and do nothing. Like I could, that just sent me into like a state of terror. So I was like, okay, I will give you two minutes. I will spend two minutes max. I'm not going to sit down. I'm going to stand in my kitchen, look out my window, take like three sips of coffee and like three deep breaths and call it good. And so that's what I started doing and it worked. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I was like, Imagine this that. mindfulness stuff works. So yeah, I mean, it's um, it has been an interesting process of learning how my brain works differently and like learning some of the tools that I thought were super eye roll kind of tools that do help a bit. Um, but also being super resistant and thinking that a lot of the kind of the stuff that should work for an anxious brain would actually work for my anxious brain. Yeah. Uh, I think about this frequently. We are as individuals, both the cause and the solution to all of our problems. Uh, totally. You know, and, and I remember I, cause same, I mean, I'm contrarian by nature. I mm. mean, I pushed against the grain my entire childhood, always in trouble for being like, don't tell me what to do. That's that stubbornness element, yeah. but it's paid massive dividends in my life in a positive way. Once I learned how to control it. Yes. And and one of my, one of my, the, actually the best therapist, sorry to all you other people who weren't the best, <laughs> the best therapist I ever worked with. He actually literally said, cause I was having five panic attacks a day mm. at the height of the chaos of my life in my late twenties into my early, early thirties, like 30, 31 was having like four or five panic attacks a day, like crippling. And he said to me, you're worried about things that haven't happened yet. Oh, that's my gift. And I'm like, okay, so what? Like I've only ever worried about things that haven't happened yet because I grew up in so I don't know whatever it is that you're talking about on this other side. And he goes, if you're panic, very similarly, he goes, just ask yourself if you're in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. Just look around. Are you safe? Right. That is the qu- the answer is yes. Then you have to realize that now it's about controlling the response, mm-hmm. and that became a game changer for yeah. me. Because yeah. the hard part about being a human being is we want to think that we're right, even when we're seeking help. Mm-hmm. Yes, totally. And it's like, but you're not, because yeah. if you knew what the f- to do, you wouldn't be in this room right now. Absolutely. So how do you reconcile that? <sighs> Are you asking me that? I'm literally that asking you that. that is not a rhetorical. I'm literally asking that, you that. I want be, that to be a rhetorical question. Be, because here's the reality: you said, and <laughs> then I figured, and then it worked. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. now it's on you. Right. So I'm going to back up a second because you just gave a really great example. So you said that you would, you were very committed to worrying about things that hadn't happened yet. One of the things I used to do in the middle of the night, which, and I had like a checklist of like things to do when I was laying in the bed terrified of the burglars was think of all the things I should worry about because I very much thought if I worried about something, it wouldn't actually happen. And so then I was like, okay, so that means you have to think of all the bad things that could possibly happen in your whole entire life. Oh my God. I mean, it was, and I was eight. So I'm like laying in bed and I'm thinking, okay, like your house might burn down sometime. Someone might come in and murder you. I was very terrified of getting murdered by lethal injection. And I would imagine a really long needle going into my brain. Like the things that I would think, like, make sure you think of that. Were you every- watching horror movies as a kid? No, I've never watched. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time 
for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. For movies in my life. Okay. Because I know that I can think of them already in my head. So I would lay in bed thinking of these things to like convince myself that I should not ever feel safe because all these really bad things would happen. So what I have to do now is reconcile that I have to make up for not, I don't know if make up is the right word, but like I have to retrain my brain, I guess is the better phrase, retrain my brain from a, decades of conditioning from age like eight to 43 um, around the fact that you don't need to worry about what might happen that hasn't happened yet that shows no indication of actually happening and instead recognize what has actually where have you actually proven that you can get through big things hard things scary things and Mm. also like where those big things hard things scary things turn out really amazing and so one of the things i did um when i was 42 five years ago i started i learned how to ski And for someone who likes a lot of control, learning how to ski at age 42 is like the biggest disaster of a near-death experience I could possibly imagine. But it was really showing up over and over and over and being like, you're going to do this and you're going to be afraid that you're going to die every single time. And you're going to hope that there's a snowstorm that cancels lessons every single time. And Mm -hmm. I did that like three years in a row, every single Saturday during ski season, I went up on the mountain and was like, Oh my God, I just want to die. I just want to die. I just want to die. And, but it was like this exposure therapy to remind myself that you can just show up and you can do one little thing at a time and prove that you're safe in a moment and you only have to go from like point A to point B on the easiest run. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been a lot of retraining my brain to think of, to switch the, like the pathways, I think, to just to recognize what is possible and recognize where I have power and where I've always had power and where I've proven that I've had power um, repeatedly over the course of my life instead of resorting to that like oh my god this could go wrong and that could go wrong because like we know the world is going to go wrong all the time yeah <laughs> the last well few years and it is and it's back. like you know what I think about a lot is as I've gotten to the place where like I seek peace now, like in like a literal way Mm. where I'm like, how do I eliminate all the things from my life that I do ruminate about that I catastrophize? Like even like, I mean, from relationships to friendships and dating to like time, time has always been my biggest thing Mm. where it causes the most anxiety in my life. And so I always think to myself, knowing that time is a construct, like just removing it. And like, I realize there are certain people where like, if you're four minutes late, they're going to lose their I used to be that guy Mm -hmm. and now I'm just like, what? It doesn't even matter. I mean, it does matter tremendously. It's the one resource we can't get back, but letting it be Mm -hmm. the deciding factor in your mental well being, like it doesn't actually make sense. Yeah. Right. Especially when you kind of facilitate in like, oh, you're going to (laughs) die. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so if I'm all, cause like that to me, that's where I always used to be Mm -hmm. in that rumination was death. Yeah. Like yeah. in a very, maybe not lethal injection into the brain, <laughs> but like I had these about car crashes and fires mm-hmm. and always painful, just the worst deaths. Yeah. And I was just like, this is stupid. Yeah. Right. And it came in that space of looking at the environmental supports and just being like, you're safe. But you know, that thing about skiing and like wishing and hoping that these moments would happen, people do that all the time. And what's great about it, it becomes an excuse, mm-hmm. right? You're like, oh, I, I kind of figured this thing might happen today. So I'm not going right. to bother. Right. And then, right. then you're recognizing and realizing like actually you're holding yourself back. Yeah. When, Absolutely. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what was the biggest realization you had about this anxiety? Like what really has become the most profound life-changing aspect of the journey for mm. you? I think it's been probably that around I, that I'm really good at making up stories in my head. Um, and that a lot of the stories are untrue. And so whether it's worrying about something that might happen, that's not ever going to happen, um, or, I mentioned anxious attachment before. So the other thing that I'm really good at, I'm curious if you're good about the <laughs> good at this as well, is um, if someone, is, uh, a perfect example would be um, 
you send a text to someone and they don't reply or like the three dots pop up and then they go away and you immediately like go into this big story about, Oh, the the thing that I said they're mad about, they took it the wrong way or I should explain myself. And so for me, I think the biggest lesson has been this. There's all sorts of stories in my head and my default is to go to stories that are incorrect. And so learning to look at what all the other possible stories are, what are the other things and um, Glennon Doyle in uh, one of her books talked about what what is true and beautiful and like pausing to be like what else is true and beautiful in this moment like you're making up this whole story that is a catastrophe and a disaster and all the things that could go wrong there's a whole bunch of other truths here that are very possible and so mm-hmm. what are those things and how will you save space for those honor those so that you can actually move forward yeah when I day. see the three dots I'm just like I think they probably just died <laughs> this is why they haven't replied. They felt they they have That's drowned so in the bathtub. That's like so it's over. Oh, see, I think they're so mad at me. Oh my gosh! I did. I, what did? I, how did I offend them? You know, I here's what I've discovered. Like I have pissed off people so many times <laughs> in my life. It's just like okay, <laughs> you know, I get it. And oh like, my god! I, I you look to me. I look at that and I go, all right. If I piss people off, they get mad at me. Cool. Now I can learn something about okay. how we communicate yeah. together. Yeah. Right. And of also, this is probably the most important. I do not talk about important in text Mm. ever i mean ever such a good lesson right there like voice note sure and even that's probably not good enough like we need to get on a phone call yeah if we're having problems as friends in a relationship i will because i the relationship up Mm. because we text each other about everything yeah part of that was like i do think you have to honor your communication and the way that you communicate Mm. like i'm a writer first so i do find that Mm. to be my but i just started writing everything and if it's like in my head i'm like in the chaos of it I'll just write it down. I'll go to sleep. And if I feel the same way the next day, it's like, I have to get on a call because it used to be, you hate me because I did this thing. And actually it's not the thing that you're upset about, but I think it is. And so now I'm going to kind of like destroy this relationship by any means necessary. Cause then that way you'll love me. (laughs) Yes, totally. Totally. I found that like, I have to make myself pause because I'm so (sighs) reactive. Um, And so if I make an assumption about something, I have a very hard time not uh, immediately doing something about about it. And so part of my anxiety is like having a very quick reaction and also needing to immediately fix something. So if I do worry that I've said or done something wrong and that someone's mad about something, I want to fix it like in the moment immediately. And one of the things I've had to let go of is not doing that in the moment and recognizing that it's always, there's, it's always, there's always a better outcome when you give it, when you pause first. And I've made myself collect evidence around this to notice like, okay, this, this person sent me this text. It sounds like they're dissatisfied with something. I'm going to give myself two hours minimum before I respond to think through and process. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Not going to look at the three dots. I'm not going to provide the three dots. Um, And I'm going to let myself process what might be happening here instead of jump leaping to my panic story. And usually by the end of two hours, and sometimes if, it's more than that, but I can see, oh, now that I think about it, like that person had that other really stressful thing this morning. I bet like that's part of what was tied up in their response or, oh, now, you know, today was a hard day. What Like I can think how I'm jumping to conclusions that really center myself around something that might not have anything to do with me or making, making up stories in my head. Um, and in pushing that pause, what I've been able to find is that I respond very differently than I would have if I had responded immediately and that the outcomes are usually so mutually beneficial. And so whether this is like in a friendship, whether it's in something related to my work, whether it's in something that I'm doing, I am the co-chair of the parent association at my son's school. So there's stuff that comes up with that where I'm like wanting to be on it. Anytime I let something breathe, I have a better response. I, the other person feels seen, I feel seen. And then like everybody wins instead of me going into panic, which either puts me or the, and, or the other person on the defense. And then all of a sudden you have this like really big situation that never needed to be a big situation. Yeah. I I think about this on the daily, the peace is in the pause. Yeah, totally. Like that just sits in my brain because growing up, having to kind of figure out to navigate the world, 
navigate relationships, understand dynamics that you learn from parents and teachers and television and film. Everything's reactive all the time. Oh, yeah. Right. And it's like moving at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the craziest events of your life, they need time. Yeah. Like you have to sit in that for a minute. Right. The pain, right. the hurt, the shame, the guilt. But, you know, often it's those very things that keep us crippled too. Mm -hmm. So there's the sitting in it and then there's like the living in it. Yeah, yes. And the, yeah, like don't sit in it for too long. There is a difference between like sitting in it intentionally for a moment, but not sitting in it, not sitting in the shit for forever. Yeah. For sure. Simon Sinek talks about this concept of like just sitting in the mud, mm, like yeah. being in it and, yeah. and sometimes just being in it and supporting, mm -hmm. hearing someone, having them be present with you in this moment. And then being able to pull yourself out. Yeah. And and I think that's the most difficult aspect of all of this mm -hmm. because anxiety, depression, stress, guilt, shame, like they almost become per what you were talking about, like this is my normal. Mm -hmm. This is my normal. Right. I feel this all the time. Right. How do you handle it when it's mm -hmm. like you you're in it for two days and you don't even realize it and yeah. then you realize it now what do you do that's a great question and as you were talking i was thinking um one of the things that i've really worked on doing and some days i'm better than others is changing the baseline and so like i mentioned the baseline before was like wake up every morning with this like big knot of dread and like oh my gosh how am i gonna get through this day and there's all these things and what if i can't do them and what if i don't meet expectations and so changing the baseline and catching myself and so when I do wake up with that, and like today's a great example. I woke up and I was like, okay, I have to get on a flight. We're going to come do these two interviews, which is like new and different, exciting, but just new and different. And then going to this retreat, I have to do some stuff tonight with related to that. Um, and coming off of a big day yesterday. And so I woke up and I was like, okay, okay I got to do this and that and the other thing. And then changing the baseline to be like, hold on, wait, you're going to do the work that you love the most. And you get to go see this friend that you met at a conference a few months ago who like it's going to be super fun to go to their fancy podcast studio. And then I'm going to see other colleagues tonight and re just changing that baseline to recognize, wait, you're about to go do really cool things. You're about to go have fun. You're about to go like sit in your gifts and mm. and get to like really receive the fruits of the work that you have been doing for the last personally and professionally, the work that you've been doing for the last number of years. So just take a breath take a beat and then like now let's start your day and it was that it was you know my two minutes over coffee this morning that I was able to um really recognize recognize like instead of immediately going into the place of do this do this do this before you you know as you prepare for the day instead I'm like oh my gosh these are the things I get to do today and it's resetting that baseline so then when I go into a season which happens my work right now is really compartmentalized which is so exciting, but also can be really overwhelming because I'm putting on some days I'm like going into a corporation and doing a training on resiliency and having to put on like corporate Sarah hat. And then mm. other days I'm doing my mom working with moms on the podcast and those can feel really different at times. And so when I get into a season where I'm changing hats a lot, which can sometimes be the course of a few weeks where I'm jumping around quite a bit and then add in co-chairing stuff at my son's school, um, I can get into those moments where the panic starts to show up and where I feel I, I for me, it gets to this feeling. And I say this to my husband all the time and then want to retract it where I say, I just want it to be over with. Like, I just want to get through the next couple of weeks and like, then I can exhale or then like, I'll be more relaxed or then, you know, it'll quote unquote, go back to normal. And I'm really, again, working on like resetting that baseline that sitting in the mud is like, well, yeah, it's muddy because it feels like a lot right now. But also, like, this is everything you've been trying to make happen for, yeah. you know, the last seven years of your career. So let's be excited about it. And then also trust that this is what you've been preparing for. And these are the things that you were meant to do. And you've proven yourself over and over again in all these capacities that you have to show up in the, in the next couple of weeks already. So just, you know, exhale a little bit. So yeah. it's, it's a lot of self talk I mean, it's, it's using the skills that, like, we tell other people to use on ourselves, which is all the time it's a gift and also it's so maddening yeah to to well, it, it is because like here's the thing that like i've discovered now doing mm -hmm. this for as long as i have monday i was like entrepreneurship <laughs>
this totally podcast. Same. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> right? Bye forever. <laughs> totally. and, and look, and truth be told, I've always said if I wake up one morning and I do not want to do Think Unbroken, I will close mm-hmm. it all down. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. I don't care if it's seven years, 17 years, 70 years. Right. Because it's about me feeling fulfilled, helping people, guiding them, showing up, living in authenticity, and feeling fulfilled. And so when I wake up on a day like that, it is about the baseline. It's me going, okay, assistant, clear the whole calendar. Mm-hmm. I'm going to the beach. Yeah. yeah. I don't care because we, we have to remember. And I think this applies to everyone. And I know it's not always that easy. And we're, we're fortunate because we put ourselves in a position to be fortunate. But I mean, even when, when I worked in corporate, like I was terrified to take time off and to mm-hmm. rechange the base or change the baseline and to put myself first. And I think that most people, the reason we're so anxious is because we don't have a five seconds of free time. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And it's like, give yourself those five seconds of free time. Give yourself that space to recalibrate, to totally. get back into your essence, to be in your physical body, not dissociated, right. not consumed with media and television on, on Instagram, but to just, you know, sit down for 30 minutes and drink the coffee and not be worrying about all the things. Right. Right. I just recorded an episode yesterday on how to recover from shining extra bright. (laughs) And what I meant by that was like, when you go through these moments where you have to really show up or life is really intense, or you have to like live in, whether it's in a position of visibility or a position of vulnerability, how do you then conscientiously give yourself space to recover from that on the other end of it? Because if you're just going in the last few years have made us do this and being a parent can make you do this. Um, and, and in most careers can make you do this where you're just jumping from one big thing to the next and having to show up in these big hard ways without any sort of pause in between that can create a lot of anxiety, even if you are not already prone to anxiety. Um, but if you are prone to anxiety, then you need to be extra intentional around how do you like show up for the thing where you're really shiny and doing hard work or even really great work that maybe doesn't feel hard, but it's just hyper visibility. And then how do you on the back end of that recognize like, okay, and now I need to destimulate a little bit. Like now I need to have a moment to exhale. Now I need to have a moment where my brain is not going. Um, I found myself folding laundry last weekend, which is like a least favorite task, but loving it because I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I just don't have to think about anything for the first time in two mm. weeks right now. And then I was like, oh my gosh, you need more mental breaks. Like laundry should not be your respite. <laughs> and so this clearly means that you have been shining really bright, having to show up in big ways and not having enough time. So like, I love your example of the beach, knowing that that's your thing. Um, for me, it's walking or running. And so recognizing like, I haven't been doing a good enough job of getting myself out the door to just be in my thoughts versus showing up and being of service to other people over the last few weeks. And I'm feeling that now. Yeah. And for me also, like I, I try to schedule that stuff in Yeah. like at physical activity, whether yeah. I'm doing martial arts or I'm at the gym, yeah. like having that. And when I'm there, one of the things I started doing is just like only listening to music, mm. like no podcast, yes. no personal <laughs> development. You remember back in the day when podcasts didn't exist? exist you would listen to music at the gym and i was like i have to bring this back into my life yeah right because i realized i consume podcasts and i say this all the time sorry guys i consume podcasts the way that people watch television shows it's it's like all i do yeah right but are they all educational all of them so i except for whitney cummings okay which is a comedy podcast which i absolutely love so i go through phases definitely go through educational phases in podcasting but because of that hyper consumption of of, um, and learning and needing to step away from that. I also have very specific things that I listen to in sometimes it's in certain times of life or certain seasons, or sometimes it's related to what's happening in the world. So like right now I'm listening just to all the random interviews about season four, love is blind. And it is like so (laughs) mindless and so fantastic. And you need that. Yes. And so it's been like my respite the last few weeks. I mean, when I was folding laundry the other day, it was like listening to a love is blind interview with a um, person from the show and just letting that be the thing that like lets my mind go. So whether it's, I mean, music would be similar where you can just like let your mind go and you're not having to, sit and process. I think that listening to someone else's conversation can still be, um, you know, consuming in a different way. I would agree with you that music, I think actually lets you process things, which mm-hmm. can help you get from point A to point B. I think that can be very therapeutic. My love is blind podcasts are not therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> they are great they, escapism. They are. If you're like, my relationship isn't this bad. <laughs> um, that can be true. <laughs> um, 
this has been awesome. Um, oh my gosh, I feel like great. we just barely touched the surface. We probably need four hours. This is what happens when you put podcasters together. I know. It's so fun. Um, but that said, before I ask, ask you my last question, tell everybody where they can find you and learn more. So people can find me um, on wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm um, My show is the Shameless Mom Academy. I'm at shamelessmom.com. And then all my speaking stuff is at saradine.com. Awesome. And of course, we'll put the links in the show notes Thank for the you. audience. Guys, Thank go over to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. Look up Sarah Dean, and we'll have all of those links and more for you there. Thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. My last question for you, my yes. friend. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? Uh, so for me, being unbroken means taking all of the imperfect little pieces, some of which have been shattered maybe multiple times, and cobbling them together into something that still has a lot of strength and power, but is still somewhat uh, is it malleable, the word, like can still be shifted and reorganized as needed to be adaptable and nimble. Mm, I love that. It's so true. I resonate with that a lot, actually. I hope not everyone else said that same answer. <laughs> no. Well, you know, we've had a lot of answers. So <laughs> I'm like, wait, does everyone say that? <laughs> that, is, that one is uniquely yours. So. Okay, good, 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 good. Thank you for being here, my friend. Unbroken Thank Nation. You so much. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, every time you share this episode and this content, you're helping other people turn their trauma tra and tragedy into triumph and become the hero of their own story. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review, and you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.